Okay, so this presentation is based on my dissertation, which is divided into six chapters. For the sake of time today, I'm gonna to primarily focus on the main findings from my introduction, three substantive, substantive chapters and conclusion. Mount Elgin forces you to engage with its environment, even in your first encounters. The mountain prepares you to regard it with respect and magnanimity. 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 <laughs> the effect is palpable among residents as they make their way home from Uganda's capital, Kampala. Packed tightly into taxis, which will take the passengers up and up and up towards home. The air is the first sign you're near. Driving from Kampala towards Mount Elgin, there's a moment when the air shifts. It becomes thin, clear, fresh, and reminiscent of rain. Taxi windows are shoved open and passengers quickly show visible relief from the change. The silence that ballooned during the middle of the five plus hour trip from the capital gives way to chatter. Arrangements are made as travelers remind the driver where they would like to be dropped off, passing fare from one person to the next until it reaches the conductor at the front. Friends discuss what they will do when they arrive home. A sense of ease and belonging extends over the passengers like fog clearing as the sun rises. Mountain peaks blossom from hazy clouds as the driver nears in Bali, the regional center for the eastern, eastern districts of Uganda. Rock faces peek out of grassy hills and border, boulders hug the sides of the road, dwarfing the taxi without effort. Brightly painted advertisements adorn some, selling paint, honey, cellular plans, or medicines. Farmlands give way to shop fronts. Buildings get taller and more crowded. As you enter in Bali City, the increase in people, cars, and activity is noticeable. Following the traffic circles, the taxi dips in and out of the city, from the edges to the center to the edges again, spitting out one or two passengers out along the way. Finally, the taxi turns at the junction in Niembe, it passes small produce stands selling ripened tomatoes, grilled corn, and sweet mangoes to travelers. The air again changes, now damp, heavy, and cold. The high elevation gives you a buzz. Passengers pull out sweaters and shawls to cover themselves and carefully tuck babies deep into blanketed cocoons, shielding off the harsh mountain weather. The road is no longer a straight, flat expanse extending into the distance. It disappears around rocky corners, switching back and forth as the earth gets steeper and steeper. At every turn, the mountain theatrically reveals what's next. A new stretch of road, one side angled acutely upward, the other sloping harshly down. Anticipation mounts as you climb up. The taxi begins to slow, chugging forward weakly as lighter vehicles pass it by. A passenger calls out to the driver, mockingly, it would be easier to walk. Tractor trailers sit abandoned at the sides of the road, rocks shoved firmly behind tires, defeated. The taxi driver shifts gears and the vehicle hefts itself forward, lurching violently. Passengers grip their seats with concern. Will the taxi truly be able to finish this trip? Many vehicles have not, and travers, travelers frequently die on this mountain's roads. Many feel that drivers not from the area should avoid the roads entirely as a matter of safety, the dangers being too acute. Most taxis that travel between Kampala and the upper slopes of Mount Elgin are from companies based in Kapchorwa, driven by locals who know the risks of mountain driving. Even the most experienced drivers must negotiate their speed and driving style with nervous passengers, those who are very aware of the mountain's brutality. As the vehicle climbs the steep inclines, a drama ensues. The scene begins with an older woman calling out to the driver from the back of the vehicle. She chastises the young man for his recklessness. She pleads to him, my children are at home waiting for me. She does not want to die today. She knows the owner of the taxi company and will report him if he does not improve. She ends by saying again that she does not want to die, especially not in this taxi. The driver remains silent, but drives much more cautiously until the taxi deposits the woman along the roadside close to her home. 
As the taxi continues, it reaches the plateau at the top of the hill. The ease of the flat road makes it feel as if the vehicle is flying. Relief sets in and there's an opportunity to look at the surroundings. Everything that's not rock is covered with green and the world is green on Mount Elgin. Not a half-hearted yellow green where the leaves are young, translucent and fresh or losing color as they transition to brown crepe skeletons. The green on Mount Elgin is mature and robust. The hills, hillsides are congested with banana plants, leaves reaching up to the sun. Runoff from the mountaintop flows in white-capped rivers, cascading waterfalls and steady streams. The banks of rivers are kaleidoscopes of color and texture, lined with freshly washed clothes laid out to dry. Many a steep slope has been tamed, carved into cultivated terraces filled with crops or eucalyptus trees. At some point, the mountain is no longer a destination to be reached. It is everywhere. Peering down from its edges, you can see land stretching out for miles and miles below. The light and air refract, distorting the ground into vague patches of greens, reds, and tans seen from above. The tin roofs of houses glinting against the sun. Men, women, and children walk along the edges of the road, at times turning abruptly to follow well-worn footpaths that wind up and down the mountain like scars in the earth. Red soil glares through the green vegetation, marking paths as if they were lines on a map, leading the knowing traveler onward to their destination. They connect one home to another, weaving between shambas haphazardly while the leaves from the banana, maize, and coffee provide light shade. Stubborn, pervasive, the paths continue through rivers, over volcanic rock, under boulders, past schools and towns and shops and homes, across fields and forests and anywhere worth traveling to. Residents of Mount Elgin rely on and engage with the environment daily. The mountain makes escaping the environment and its influences nearly impossible. Mount Elgin bring, brings rain, landslides, rivers, hail, lightning, and mud. Land is farmed, livestock are grazed, firewood is collected, and water is used from local sources. Walks on paths are punctuated by arms reaching out to grab bundles of nightshade, to pluck cabbage and small red onions from the field for dinner, to break off long grasses from the stem to chew absentmindedly along the way. Places are in the upper or downer part of the mountain, at times used relatively, other times used as a discrete category. You cannot travel on Mount Elgin without battling against its mountain slopes. No matter which direction you take, you must tread with attentiveness. Be wary of the rocks, cliffs, loose soil, slick clay. Children return home from school, running down them happily with their friends. Shoes missing from when they were carelessly sent bobbing down the river while playing. Pockets full of tart wild fruits picked while climbing trees. Knees, legs, and clothes covered in red clay mountain mud. Told from the perspective of rangers, residents, government officials, and conservation authorities, this project investigates the lived experiences of environmental protection and conservation at Mount Elgin National Park. Through an ethnographic study of Mount Elgin National Park in Uganda, it considers the tactics and logics of rule used by authorities to claim and control spaces of environmental protection and traces the impact of these modes of governance on bureaucratic norms, state sanctioned violence, and the livelihood strategies of people residing in and near these protected areas. This ethnographic case study grapples with the relationships between the environment, the state, and residents of Mount Elgin, who are for the most part citizens of Uganda and consider themselves as such by dint of heritage and legal convention. I examine how the governance of Mount Elgin National Park as a designated protected area plays out on the ground. Mount Elgin National Park is one of five protected areas within the transboundary Mount Elgin system between Uganda and Kenya. The region is conserved for its water, forests, and biodiversity. Uganda Wildlife Authority, or UWA, is the primary state organization responsible for protecting and managing Mount Elgin National Park. Approximately 1.5 million people reside in the eight districts surrounding Mount Elgin, 
And it is well documented that people living in the Mount Elgin region heavily depend on local resources to survive. Given the limitations of space, increasing population densities, and local resource requirements, environmental protection at Mount Elgin must operate within a narrow margin constrained by the coexisting realities of local needs and conservation intentions. Conflicts between surrounding communities and park authorities have marked the history of the protected area, and anthropogenic challenges to conservation goals are expected to increase with rising population pressures and the resulting environmental impacts. I utilize the tools of ethnographic research to document and assess what environmental protection means in the day-to-day -day realities of those who live and work in the Mount Elgin National Park protected area and surrounding environs. I ask, what are the tactics and logics of rule in play at Mount Elgin National Park in the name of environmental governance? I further consider how Mount Elgin National Park is territorialized through claiming, monitoring, and control of space by governing authorities. I attend to the fissures and gaps that emerge as environmental governance is enacted and experienced. This optic brings into view the many ways the official or intended ends of environmental governance result in substantially different yet systematic outcomes. Most of all, I'm concerned with how these patterns and strategies of environmental governance impact the daily lives of people living and operating in and around the park including how residents and communities accede or push back against the practices and pressures asserted by governing authorities. Given state citizen tensions and ensuing imposition of environmental regula regulation in the name of resource protection, my research investigates how processes of claiming, controlling, and subjectifying people in the name of environmental governance plays out. How do the aims of environmental protection affect the way state bodies engage with its citizens? How might the restrictions that come with protection increase citizen reliance on state goods and services, particularly in the case of subsistence cultures such as those found on Mount Elgin? In what ways does the governance of resources and the environment differ from the governance of people? Through the first-hand lens of ethnography, I analyze how state authority and control operates in spaces of environmental protection in Mountain Elgin National Park and the communities surrounding the park. I consider how protected areas are controlled and claimed by state authorities. In observing the distinctive qualities and effects of environmental governance, I likewise consider what protected areas mean for the state and what they tell us about the state apparatus and it and its engagements with citizens, territories, and resources under its rule. <clears throat> Along with ethnographic study at the community level, I extend my ethnographic investigations to documents, policies, and governmental practices and institutions deployed in the name of protection. Participant observation was employed to record daily activities, behaviors, and norms within these communities, drawing on interviews, informal con conversations, direct observations of others, and my own experiences. Participant observation was conducted at Mount Elgin National Park, in adjacent local communities, and in offices and headquarters of organizations involved in Mount Elgin's environmental protection and governance. In-depth, open-ended interviews were also used to clarify the relationship between protected areas, people, and the state. A total of 83 research participants were selected for interviews through purposive sampling, focusing on their connections to Mount Elgin National Park. An additional 68 participants were involved in preliminary semi-structured surveys. Research was conducted with the help of a translator in English, Kiswahili, Kup Sabine, and Lubisu all languages spoken in the Kaptoro district of Uganda. Chapter three, order through disorder, an ethnographic exploration of gaps in protected area governance, focuses on an analysis of memorandums of understanding or MOUs between UA and park adjacent communities. I find that despite their creation as a document promoting community conservation and local collaboration, 
MOUs instead function as an evolving set of institutions, which often oppose the stated purposes of these agreements and led to conflict between UA and communities. Ethnographic analysis of Monalga National Park uncovers a culture of intensifying disordered governance experienced by Monalgan residents over generations, characterized by inconsistent and often violent tactics of control and assertions of authority by wildlife officials in the name of conservation. Observations from this ethnographic analysis fit well with previously established scholarship, which recognized the additional hardships that often impact people who are neighbors to protected areas, as well as works which note the ways in which protected areas act as localized spaces for amplified state involvement. In examining state assemblages and environmental governance at Mount Elgin National Park, I explore how disorder is employed as a political instrument. My research builds from Chabal and Deleuze's work to consider how disorderly governance is experienced by Mount Elgin's environmental residents. I ask, what are the characteristics attributed to the logics of disorder deployed in environmental governance at Mount Elgin National Park? I find that disorder manifests within the state assemblage inherently, while also being operationalized via violence, uncertainty, or chaos by state actors to assert control over citizens. My observations indicate that spaces of environmental protection constructed with the logic of protecting resources rather than people amplify disorder experienced in communities bordering the park. An analysis of MOUs between UA and communities neighboring Mount Elgin National Park points to how disorder manifests in institutions and practices of environmental governance. MOU agreements serve as a mode through which state actors at Mount Elgin can take what is perceived as disorder, unwieldy, or wild, i.e. the use of the forest unregulated by the state, and operationalize it to amplify power in areas with limited state capacity. Resource collection within the park was identified as one of the most prevalent experiences through which community members had to contend with institutional variation. This work uncovers the MOUs for resource use agreed upon between UA and parishes neighboring the park are utilized by state actors as both a contract and a set of loosely followed norms. Thus, MOUs became sources of uncertainty, instability, and conflict in state citizen relations. Further, MOUs produce gaps in the apparatus of environmental governance, observable in park ranger policies and practices. I find that often at Mount Elga National Park, local state actors are left to deploy theoretical policies and objectives on the ground where the theoretical simply does not exist or fit. This leads to discrepancies between policy and practice and produces a power dynamic in which local actors are called upon to make in the moment determinations of how state policy should play out. In this sense, park rangers become the embodiment of UA and state objectives whether or not they abide by state intentions, thereby increasing the power held and at times deployed by individual actors. Research reveals that UA interactions with citizens at Mount Elgin National Park involved mass evictions, violent encounters, aggressive and erratic boundary management, frequent refusals of community rights and pervasive negative framings of local cultures. MOUs imply that conflict can only arise from communities, not UA, suggesting that UA and its agents are incapable of producing conflict. These patterns point to the exclusion and restrictions of citizens from the park and complicate the stated intentions of Mount Elga National Park as a community conservation-oriented protected area. Instead, reports indicate that fortress conservation approaches are also at play. The park's identity crisis and its conservation management style has clear consequences in the way it creates governance contradictions and produces discord between communities and UA. Chapter four, amplifying disorder through the gaps, militarizing conservation at Mount Elgin, considers how gaps in governance amplified cultures of militarization and state-based conservation organizations operating at Mount Elgin National Park. This chapter explores 
coercive and militarized behaviors, rhetoric, practices, and policies which leveraged UA power over Mount Elgin residents and resource users. Ethnographic inquiries indicate that violent forms of governance are utilized by state actors in an attempt to secure claims to control and authority at the park. Militarized forms of conservation are amplified as contradictions become the work of armed wildlife rangers to resolve in day-to-day -day park operations. Arrests and apprehensions made within Mount Elgin National Park function with, within bureaucratic gaps, limiting the efficacy of citizen pushback. As institutions such as MOUs underwent formalization and renegotiation, rules and regulations in practice became subject to informal renegotiation as well. Rangers are thus able to reshape UA community dynamics, using their authority as state actors to control people and the environment via new arrangements until formal rules are adopted. Intentions of conservation at Monoga National Park balance between its role as a community conservation program and its function as a militarized arm of the state. My research reveals that residents are identified by UA Rangers as enemies of conservation and spreaders of rumor and propaganda against the state. Cultures of Mount Elgin communities are considered corruptive to the conservation missions of UA, and park adjacent communities are referred to as frontline villages as if enemies in war against park rangers. Further, I find that community members emerging as criminals in the context of the park are left with little recourse as institutions once meant to include them in conservation are used as tools for oppression and subversive forms of control by local state actors. I find that UA officials are placed at the forefront of handling governance contradictions experienced locally. I uncover that these actors lean into points of disorder, leveraging them as a tactic and strategy of governance. Moreover, UA officials establish what I call a standard of disbelief, in which the burden of proof is placed on residents and resource users to support their claims. In this arrangement, often citizens are identified as the most obvious transgressors of the park's conservation goals, trapped at points of contradiction. Meanwhile, politicians and bureaucrats' transgressions are noticeably more opaque and physically distanced from park spaces and thus prone to less recognition. Local leaders and community advocates do not have the capacity to resist structures of governance as they are impossible to pin down difficult to navigate and constructed with the intention to rebuff inquiry. Chapter five, Evergreen, Territorialization and Boundary Governance at a Transboundary Protected Area, contextualizes territorialization through an accounting of the 2017 Uganda Ministry of Land Survey at Mount Elgin National Park. Findings illustrate that applications of disordered governance allow for the initiation of territorialization cycles, exacerbate existing marginalization in neighboring communities, and limit the ability of the state to fully establish and maintain claims to territory. Findings suggest that claims to Mount Elgin National Park's territories have long been tenuous. Characterized by boundary changes, encroachment and deforestation, institutional variation, limited enforcement, political and organizational instability, and unclear administration of policies and practices. Past governmental efforts to deconstruct local regimes of land and resource use remain unresolved or incomplete. As new land claims are made by the state in the name of the park, little is done to secure control over these territories in practice. Thus, state control over space, as well as the authority and legitimacy of state actors at Mount Elgin National Park is put into question by recurring yet incomplete territorialization attempts. My research indicates that territorialization cycles at Mount Elgin National Park are characterized by contradictions which emerge as abstract ideas meet the realities of practice and implementation. As shifts in the governance apparatus occur through changes in policies, stakeholders, conservation priorities, state logics, or support, a cycle of attempted territorialization begins. 
As these changes in governance move from ideas to plans, objectives, and practices, disjunctures occur. Such shifts produce frontier phases where authority, rights, power, and territories are contested and reconfigured. I find that this stage destabilizes state-citizen relations. As landholder rights are put into question, property contest contestations ensue, and state coercion is utilized as conflicts arise. As a period of territorialization plays out, environmental authorities attempt to claim and establish control over the protected area and secure the right to protect its territories. The stage in the territorialization cycle is marked by disordered applications of resettlements, boundary decisions, and approaches to clearing and controlling land in and around the protected area. This research establishes citizens neighboring the park experience precarity and insecurity linked to conservation. Boundary sites and the citizens living in and near these spaces are subjected to iterative territorialization attempts, destabilizing property rights. Marked by contradicting disordered modes of control and authority, these sites shift from clearly defined territories as initially imagined to challenged frontiers. While spaces of environmental protection are revised, reformed, and determined, what it means to be an environmental subject also changes, is revised, reformed, and determined. Even as subjecthood is established, the rules of engagement continue to shift. Newly recognized subjects cannot identify the changing political structures in which they operate and exist. Affected communities thus adopt strategic and often risky ways of responding to surveys, property contestations, policy lags, and other uncertainties that arise from territorialization. Attempts at territorialization are delegitimized through community resistance as control over land and resources is disputed and challenged. In chapter six, my conclusion, wild states, state practices through the lens of environmental protection, I consider how the case of Mount Elgin National Park in Uganda tells us much about the interface of transboundary protected areas, local citizens and state actors and institutions in the making of environmental governance regimes. Most notably, the dynamic of environmental governance at Mount Elgin National Park demonstrates the diverse uses of disorder in the formula, formulation and expression of state authority in the context of resource frontiers where environmental protection trumps the protections of persons, property, and livelihoods. These arrangements are evident in document and institution-based modalities of rule and the distinct processes of governing and claiming territory in and around Mount Elgin's transboundary protected area pursued by state agents. They are further apparent in the experiences, attitudes, and coping strategies of the persons who reside and rely on this environmental border zone. Taken together, these perspectives across documents, institutions, state actors, and local residents and resource scapes bring into view the lived contours of governance at Mount Elgin diffused through the complex and widely celebrated apparatus of environmental protection in the region. As it plays out in Mount Elgin National Park, protected areas heighten opportunities for state agents and institutions expression and promotion of disorder as a political instrument. Here disorder is not a secondary feature of environmental governance, but a central modality of making claims on persons, resources, and places within the sphere of the park. Enabling the assertion of control over spaces of nature and whose livelihoods rely on them. These logics and modalities of rule represent the two faces of what I call wild states. While one, the supposed wild state nature, does not cause the other, the heightened instrumentalization of disorder by state actors, the former serves as a premise for the latter. In the case of Mount Elgin National Park in Uganda, this is due to the state's propensity for militarization, limited means, and an international context that promotes conservation and environmental protection as a currency of global value and recognition. The foregoing chapters on territorialization, the militarization of UA, gaps in policy and practice, and the experiences of living on Mount Elgin 
call attention to the specific ways disorder is produced and plays out at Mount Oga National Park. In this context, the imagined ideas and ideal applications of governing drive real governance. Outcomes as well as conventions that are routinely produced as governing takes place in reality. In this space, the imagined is distanced and distorted as it evolves from ideals to application. In this gap, frictions and disconnects emerge, creating opportunities for disorder to amplify and accrue at the hands of state agents. While such divergence can happen in any setting, at Mount Oga National Park, it's heightened by the unique history of Uganda's security apparatus. Coupled with the shifts and expectations of international agencies and mandates, and the especially elusive conditions of natural resource management in the protected zone. Disjunctures are present in all systems of governance. What is distinctive in the governance of Mount Oga National Park is how governance gaps are systematically amplified to produce intensifying forms of disordered rule as a modality of control, both justified by and reshaping the context of environmental protection in which they occur. In the face of these disjunctures, state actors worth wit work with and through disorder to create structures of governing characterized by violence, perpetual yet constantly shifting efforts of territorialization, adoption of standards of disbelief when engaging with citizens, arbitrary institutional changes, and informal or unreported arrests and punishments. These strategies collectively undermine citizens' capacity to resist state incursions. As a result, citizens are largely marginalized and their rights to property, resources, and bodily protection are routinely infringed. These arrangements both alienate citizen residents from the state and make them increasingly dependent upon it. With fault heaped upon Mount Elgin communities and cultures, residents find themselves ever more reliant, reliant upon state bodies and regulations to guarantee resource access and security, despite the manifold harms they face in the name of environmental protection. Governance at Mount Elgin National Park, from this perspective, exemplifies a distinctive complex of rule while in some ways protected area governance here mirrors strategies of fortress conservation, this classification oversimplifies the operative features of the governing apparatus at work. Although force and the threat of force are key elements, it is disorder that is the most insistent facet of rule in this protected environmental zone. At Monoga National Park, Disorder manifests in a wide range of ways via day-to-day -day logics and tactics of rule. Through institutional unevenness, disbelief, criminalization of communities, coercive tactics, and cycles of territorialization. In this system, disorder is inherent. It is a byproduct of the complexity of the governance system and further enabled by the natural unwieldiness of the space and resources of the protected area. State actors identify this disorder and routinely operationalize it in their relationship with Mount Elgin residents. As a result, at Mount Elgin National Park, disorder operates as a structural feature of the state apparatus and a functional tool intentionally employed by state actors used to close the gaps in this system. Processes of incomplete territorialization at Mount Elgin are core features of disordered governance in protected areas. Although state bodies have many openings to clear the protected area of encroachers, standard forms of territorialization, stabilizing boundaries and rights have never fully occurred. Instead, Mount Elgin National Park is subject to recurring and or incomplete cycles of territorialization prolonging the frontier phase of the territorialization cycle. The political effects of these dynamics are several. As the park's frontier character persists, competition over territorial control increases as property rights, land use practices, and survey outcomes continue to be sources of dispute. In this way, disorder is sustained and serves as a form of control in which citizens continually challenge state claims to territory, and state actors respond with coercive tactics in turn. It is these practices of claiming space and control 
techniques of incomplete territorialization via the reproduction of territorial and resource frontiers, which are crucial to consolidation of state power. Territorialization cycles at Monoga National Park are perpetuated by the unwieldiness and wildness of the protected area. At Monoga National Park, state capacity is low, resources are limited, and infrastructure is almost non-existent. Disorder, hence, is an inherent feature of the state apparatus. Territorialization attempts amplify disorder both intentionally and unintentionally. Sometimes this results in territorial claims. However, it's important to recognize that disorder occurs within territorialization cycles prior to its weaponization. Disorder persists through these processes because claiming territory, particularly in protected areas, is always a naturally uneven, chaotic, and unpredictable endeavor. Findings from Mount Elgin National Park raise further questions about what protected areas signify for the concept of the state in Uganda and more generally. At Mount Elgin National Park, protected areas distort state-citizen relationships and lay bare the disordered applications of governance produced by the state overall. Notably, my findings suggest that Mount Elgin National Park exemplify but also confound characteristics of what Charles Tilly calls the state's protection racket, in which the state claims and citizens consent to a monopoly on violence in the name of protection of their own well being. However, in this conservation based setting, citizens are considered threats to state claims over nature. State protection is thus justified as protection from citizens. In this convoluted arrangement, although protected areas are conceptualized as re regions under protection for the people, this involves protecting environmentally significant regions from the people. Complicating the terms of Tilly's protection racket, crafting con citizen consent, or at least assent, takes a different turn. I posit that processes involving territorial claims, criminalization of citizens, violence against enemies and defensive acts over the protected area, all point to the formation of what I call resource protective states. Resource protective states depart from the well-established resource extractive states in the simple fact that their mission is not to extract, but rather protect existing resources. The state gives protection of Mount Elgin National Park in order to gain consolidated authority and control within and around the protected area. Further, the state seeks to gain the ability to conserve biological diversity and ecological processes, to manage the park sustainably, and to safeguard water resources. Extraction is not a primary driver of protection in this context. Instead, the goal is to keep things somewhat the same over time. In resource protective states, the protection racket is not voluntary, it is coerced. Protection is applied paternalistically without regard to the locally recognized culturally specific modes of engaging with the environment experienced by Mount Elgin communities. The protection racket in resource protective states is a promise that can never be fully fulfilled to the people who are provided these claims. Formal institutional arrangements are uneven, disjointed, and regularly weaponized against citizens. Buying into the protection racket comes at great expense to citizens who are forced to do so. And while perhaps future generations will benefit from these promises of protection, this is hardly a guarantee and definitely not a pledge to allow local communities to utilize the region in the ways they historically have practiced. Citizens now stripped of formal and informal rights regularly subjected to coercive forms of governance and undergoing increasing challenges to territorial rights are trapped in a racket that simply does not serve them. Ultimately, what results is magnified state power wielded against citizens who once relied on the state for protection. Findings from Mount Elgin National Park demonstrate that resource states produce unwieldy applications of governance. Resource protective states are marked by a certain configuration of power, but do not indicate state failure. Rather, they are spaces in which the state seeks to claim control over the seemingly uncontrollable. In this sense, wild states are somewhat of a self-fulfilling prophecy. 
the wilder the governance apparatus is within protected areas, the more the state must operationalize this disorder to claim control. I propose what I call wild states as an analytical and conceptual framework for uncovering and laying bare the contradictory logics, rationales, and practices of the state. I take wild states to be embedded within nation state space, found within and around protected areas and other regions of environmental importance. They are spaces not separate from the nation state, but rather are spaces where the state is in its wildest, unwieldiest form. Note that disordered governance is not a unique feature of protected areas or Mount Elgin National Park. In the case of Uganda, for example, militarized rule, violent state citizen interactions, and uneven or unpredictable modes of governance are a known part of the political and social landscape. Rather, I have found that examining disorders manifestations in the context of protected areas is interesting because it brings the contradicting logics and intentions of the state to the fore. I posit that wild states function as regions of nation state space, which makes state-based disordered governance approaches more apparent, thereby making them an apt framework for the analysis of the state. I suggest that wild states can function to highlight the ways that nation state logics and rationales are challenged and contradicted. Wild states act as stress tests for state logics and rationales. They're weird state spaces. They limit state capacities, challenge state citizen relations, and are often located in rural regions with little state control over people. There are areas in which state authority is challenged by a host of international actors with interest in environmental protection and a range of local actors relying on the protected environments for subsistence. There are regions which have limited territorial control. Wild states are subject to adopting strategies which seek to rein in this unwieldiness often through violent means, as well as strategies which operationalize this unwieldiness for state objectives, producing disordered applications of environmental governance. Prior studies show that deforestation on Mount Elgin has persisted throughout its history and efforts to protect the environment from deforestation have thus far failed. My research further indicates that environmental outcomes are not reached as territorial control is not sustained, and inconsistent and uneven resource access institutions further exacerbate the fragility of environmental protections and community relations. Ultimately, environmental conservation at Mount Elgin National Park appears to serve no one. Community conservation is attempted but instead serves as a site through which coercive state tactics are utilized against citizens who are labeled as criminals in the context of the protected area. It's important to consider how might things be improved at Mount Elgin National Park. On one hand, there is an obvious lack of state capacity to adequately administer conservation at the park. State actors regularly express that while they would like to apply environmental governance approaches, at Mount Elgin in the ways they were planned, this is nearly impossible due to budgetary and resource constraints. Simply gaining access to resources, however, would not fully resolve the issues preventing successful conservation at Mount Elgin National Park. Historically, the governance of the protected area has effectively ignored cultural and social considerations. Territorial claims to the region to regions of the protected area persist because citizens of Mount Elgin have lived in these areas long before ideas of Mount Elgin's protection existed. There is a public rec recognition of the rights of Mount Elgin citizens to Mount Elgin National Park lands under protection. Ignoring these claims have so far not worked, and the rights of Mount Elgin citizens to these territories must be addressed for protection to ever be sustainable. Further, there must be recognition of and responsiveness to the lifestyles and livelihoods of Mount Elgin residents. Conservation efforts must take into account the fact that the majority of Mount Elgin citizens rely on the environment in some way to survive. Barring them from accessing the park is not an option, as such approaches will always function in opposition to the reality of local circumstances. In addition, environmental administrators must address the disparities in representation between the makeup of resource users and Mount Elgin National Park community leadership. 
Resource users at Mount Elgin National Park are predominantly women and children, yet local leaders are almost exclusively men. Such disparities no doubt led to misrepresentation of resource user needs and concerns and thereby further exacerbate existing marginalities. Appropriate representation, which would provide attention to the gender and power dynamics of local communities is required. Comparative study, no doubt, will strengthen our understanding of protected areas and their features. Additional research on resource protected states and wild states in other national contexts would aid in the identification of broad and or context dependent trends. I suggest that comparative research on such spaces would deepen the way state environment citizen interactions are understood. There is a need to explore and analyze the comparative differences in citizen state relationships as they vary between resource protected states and wild states versus nation states. I'm interested in the ways that protected areas subjected by citizens and question whether the implications of environmental governance are intimately tied to state objectives which seek to increasingly govern, and govern subsistence cultures. How do resource protective states and wild state dynamics function to close the gap between independent citizen groups and state dependents? I propose that these inquiries could clarify distinctive features of the state as it operates and deepen understandings of citizenship in both spaces. In some protected areas, as territories within the greater nation state, expose unique and interesting qualities of state citizen relations. Using state theory to develop a better understanding about the relationships between citizens, protected areas, and the state can shine a light on gaps in governance. There's certainly a need for further research, particularly in different contexts, exploring state departures in and around protected areas. Thank you.